Hello everybody, I'm David. I'm part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. Uh, we are here with uh, Dr. Adam Bowles. But before we get into our great discussion, just want to acknowledge the lands in which we are meeting and acknowledge our uh, Indigenous uh, brothers and sisters, our, 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 the leaders, uh, past, present and emerging. So please tell us a bit about yourself, Adam, what you do at UQ. Uh, well, thanks for the invitation, David. Um, we've uh, emailed for many years, but I, we've never actually met. So it's good to actually meet. Uh, so my, uh, my role here, I'm the Deputy Head of School of the School of Historical and Philosophical Inquiry, and I'm also the convener of Studies in Religion, which is one of the four components of that school. Uh, and so that means I basically oversee the Studies in Religion major here. Um, my own area of expertise is I'm actually a Sanskritist, mainly, uh, my area of research. So I work on Sanskrit texts and in uh, early Indian religions and history. Um, and uh, often these texts are sort of narrative materials. So, so mostly what I work on are things that go back for, to about 2000 years ago and they're a mixture of narrative and normative kind of textual material. Um, but also we have what we partly talk about today is the QAR project, the Queensland Atlas of Religion, which we were successful in acquiring federal grant support for, and we're in partnership with the State Library of Queensland. Uh, and that for, my, for me is a somewhat of a new type of research because it's very contemporary. Uh, it involves different techniques because when you read, I was gonna bring up one, I haven't got one there, but I, you know, when you read old texts, you don't have to talk to people. You just bury your head in the, in the text. But, but you know, this is actually going out and speaking to people and getting to know my community better than I do, which is uh, which has been good. It's fun um, mm -hmm. and uh, something quite new and different for me. What's standing out to you so far from the research that you're all doing sort of about religion in Queensland? Um, well, firstly, what stands out is that uh, Queensland uh, is very diverse in religious terms and has been for quite a long time. I'm working, because my interests are really South Asia in my, my own uh, research uh, area, that means when I, the, the bit that I particularly focus on with the Atlas is diaspora communities. Uh, a lot, some from South Asia, some from uh, East Asia as well, and uh, Southeast Asia. And you, you, get, uh, you start to see quite similar patterns with diaspora peoples who come here at some point in time, something quite a long time ago. You know, the Sikh community arrives in Queensland probably as far back as the 1890s, maybe a bit earlier, where you get people who are, are pioneers in their communities and they set up a base. Um, and they often start, if they're, if they're involved in kind of uh, congregational religious activities, it starts in a very domestic way, often in houses or in garages um, you know people have altars in their own homes if that's what they're doing uh, and then progressively as the community uh, develops and forms and grows partly through increased migration which happened not so much in Australia until after the 1970s because of things like the white Australia policy but after that and uh, we get it you get a lot of economic migrants coming into Australia then as their own capacities build then they start looking at uh, establishing built centres around which uh, they can then attend and, and engage in the activities that their community is interested in. And often those are things we call religious activities. Uh, so we're talking really about temples. Um, and, uh, and, then, and so you can sort of, there's a sort of a pattern that occurs. So if I give an example at the moment, the Sikh community, you know, has an old base, but their first Gurudwara in Queensland is built in 19... Uh, 82, I think it is, up in um, uh, Edmonton in Cairns. Um, so it takes quite a long time. And part of the reason for that is what happens to that community as a result of Queensland labour laws and, and you know, racist policies, they, they move away. Um, but there's still a little bit of a base of community and then they start to uh, grow from that point. Now, if we compare that to the Jane community in Queensland, which is quite small and Jainism, I'm not sure if your um, listeners be aware, is one of the very old religions that came out of India. It starts around the same time as Buddhism, uh, founded by someone called uh, Mahavira Jina. 
and uh, so therefore it's called Jainism. And um, uh, because a Jaina is a follower of Jinnah, if I can just explain that. Now, the, um, that community is quite small. And so they're actually, at, at, if we think about it in stages for diaspora communities, they're at that domestic stage where they gather in people's houses and they have altars within domestic spaces. Um, so if that community keeps growing, we can anticipate where they will go because what we see with other diaspora communities. Have you seen a, a, a big difference between sort of how Southeast Asian religions operate when people come here and, and they start things up compared to say Christians? Are they, do they tend to be more religious? Do they tend to focus on certain things more than other things in the development um, in the early stages? That's a good question. Uh, well, firstly, um, the Christian pattern might have been similar, but it's much it's old. Like the, um, and whether they're more or less religious, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, working out how religious people are or not is a tricky thing. Uh, and also whether what's going on at religious places is always what we think of as religious activity because they become hubs for all sorts of community activities. Mm -hmm. And churches are like that today, you know, still as they perhaps always were and maybe more so in the past. Um, you know, when attendance obligations were a bit stronger, regardless of your actual belief system that you might have. Um, so actually, I'm not really sure. I'll, I can give you some stats, but they're not quite going to express what you're saying. So if you if you look at South Asia, now, uh, so if you take India, the largest country in South Asia, 1.4 billion people in the census, normally about 98% express religious identification. Uh, which is really high globally, um, but and compared to Australia, which has a relatively low uh, admission of religious identification, though the figures they tend to be a bit rubbery about what it actually means. You know, the nuns are often people who are quite spiritual but don't identify in institutional terms as religion. Mm -hmm. So, um, so to some degree, I'd say the the you know diasporas from South Asia, particularly, which you know and perhaps from Southeast Asia, maybe less from East Asia, uh, when we're talking about Japan and China, which have low rates of identification in Asia broadly. But yeah, from Southeast Asia and South Asia, you get a lot of people uh, who do identify in religious terms, and then that does factor into the way that diaspora communities form and develop. Um, and I think actually, you know, in some ways the diaspora communities who come from, who have those cultural bases, uh, it, it does create kind of strong sense of continuity um, because it means there are establishments. You know, I, I, when I gave that talk at SLQ that you came to, I talk about one of my interviewees who arrives in 2017, he's very well educated, you know, he's doing a postdoc here, which means he already has a doctorate in India and he's, you know, he's a middle-class and clever guy, he comes from a prosperous background in India. And um, but when he arrives in Brisbane, he first thing he does is he looks for the established Sikh community uh, because he knows that he'll have a solid base from which to grow from there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's partly what I was talking about that night. Yeah, and I remember you mentioning on the night too about you know when everyone talks about oh how's religion doing in Australia the numbers and all that but you know you pointed out in a global context you know so in other parts of the world religion like you said is up there at the ninety eight percent at least on paper. Yeah. Um, and even in Australia, it depends on the church. And, and so you never really get an accurate view of yep. you know, who's religion and who's religious and who isn't. And, and none of these issues are new. I mean, I remember reading in the 1960s, people complaining about young people are turning away from the church. So these, this is not a new um, issue. Can you uh, tell me, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think people, are, people read too much into the numbers a bit. They, and the numbers, are, they're, they're, um, they don't have a lot of nuance in them because censuses are not, they're not really for nuance. You can only find out that out by going and talking to people. But I think sometimes people equate the low identification numbers with a few other cultural phenomena that they think exists, you know, lower levels of values and morality, which I think are really not true. And also uh, that people don't have belief systems or have beliefs. And I, I think that's also not true. And so if you drill down, you can actually see that people, um, you know, they, they have belief structures and things that we call spiritual uh, that 
they're just not, they're simply not attending institutions the way they were. Now, I mean that in terms of long-standing communities in Australia rather than more recent arrivals. Mm -hmm. uh, but globally, religion isn't going anywhere. Um, there was a hypothesis that it would uh, back in the 60s and 70s, but um, it's probably, you know, it doesn't seem to be occurring at the, at the rate. No. Um, I think, you know, sometimes those numbers are affected by religious institutions being a little bit behind the times. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Can I ask you uh, specifically about the project that you're doing now yeah. with the Sikh community? Sure. So one of the, um, what we're trying to get with the QAR is we're not trying to be statistically representational of diversity. We're trying to be representational of the diversity itself. So, um, you know, if we, uh, what well, with the QAR, um, sorry, with the, the this particular little project, it's looking at one aspect of the Sikh community that you, you find wherever Sikhs are, and that is that they establish Gurudwaras, which is a Gurudwara is, means doorway to the Guru, and it's a, a temple, effectively. It's called doorway to the Guru because the main object of worship is the Guru inside, and the Guru is actually the book. The, um, the uh, Sikh community uh, had human gurus once, um, but at the 10th Guru, Guru of Gibbon Singh, uh, he was the last human guru, and he announces that the one to succeed him will, in fact, be the scriptures, effectively, which are a collection of uh, poems um, composed by different people. Uh, so when you go into a Gurudwara, that's what's on the altar. Um, and uh, But what you find next to the Gurudwara always is what's called a langa. And a langa is a community kitchen, uh, which um, is staffed by volunteers. Uh, so the cooking and the serving and the cleaning, and those people are members of the community and they provide free food. And often it's the same people who are eating the food, the ones who are cooking uh, and, uh, and um, passing out and cleaning up, they're also gonna eat it, but it's for anyone. You don't have to be sick to do it. You do need to, um, you know, observe a dress code, which is pretty simple. You've got to cover your hair and take your shoes off mainly, that's it. Uh, but it's open to anyone. And one of the reasons I thought this was a good story is because during COVID lockdowns, uh, the Sea community in Brisbane, along with others elsewhere in the world, including other parts of Australia, turned their langa practices. So in a langa, you go to a building, uh, it's actually, you, sometimes it's the Gurudwara itself, sometimes it's next to it, and you sit in uh, on the floor in lines. Everyone's at that point, you know, equal effectively. And you, you eat communally in that context on your own plate, but in a kind of communal setting. Um, so it's, you know, it's something you do when you go to the Gurudwara. So in lockdowns and, the, and subsequently during the floods, they flip this around and they turn it into a Meals on Wheels service. Uh, and then they were thanked in parliament uh, by um, who was it? Um, I forgot his first name, Scully, I think his surname is. Um, uh, the, one of the reps in federal, uh, the fed, uh, federal government for Brisbane for providing that service to the community. And it struck me as a quite a remarkable story in itself of, of service, what in, in India and Sikhs was often called seva uh, and generosity. Another word they use is dan or dana for generosity. Um, and so I thought I'd tell that story. And when you look at it, there's a very long history of the practice of langa in the Sikh community uh, in India. They also did Meals on Wheels during lockdowns in India too, as they did in Canada and the US. Um, but it's become a really core feature of the community and one that they're very proud of. And they, they, uh, it, it enables them actually to pursue core Sikh principles around community activity, service, generosity, um, and so on. Right. I've been there and they really put on, you know, good food. Like we're talking, as you would know, like we're getting dessert, we're getting main meals, we're getting, you know, drink. In my experience with Christian churches, being an Anglican is that, you know, there's a food pantry, maybe, uh, you, you'll get a can of beans. See you later. <laughs> Do you think that the Sikh model could be 
incorporated into say Christian churches and, and for those Christian churches out there that are saying oh David we do provide you know meals but generally the experience is it's a, it's a food pantry it's not like the sinks do you think that that model could be incorporated or is there something unique to to the kind of the Sikh faith tradition where it would be hard for other religious groups to kind of do it and maintain it there's no reason why any group religious or not, couldn't do this sort of activity. But what it requires is the it, an internalisation of a set of values and principles. And that's the hardest part. You know, if you, if you spend time within this community, there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a commitment to a cultural tradition. Um, and so, the, you know, a, an understanding of the joy of being around other people who are doing similar sorts of things but the, the, the pleasure that's taken into doing service to a community and giving. And so all that food, you know, why, one of the reasons why it's, you're getting half a dozen different dishes of different textures and flavours, all of that's donated by the same people. And they, they, you know, they've got pantries and they actually often say, these are the things we need donated. And, the, and um, uh, sometimes they've got too much and they'll say, no, don't donate for a bit. Um, but, you know, sometimes if you're a, if you've got a job, the expectation is you would donate ten percent of your salary to those sorts of things. Now, again, the for people to actually follow that as a kind of moral code, it just doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of effort over time, and people have to kind of internalise it as a significant thing of their cultural life. And that's what's happened in the Sikh community. So, um, uh, the, the and part of that is expressed in pride, and part of it's expressed in then trying to persuade the next generation that we've got something good here, let's continue it. And you can see that that's a bit of an anxiety. Um, it was actually interesting, I go, the one I've been to a bit is a Tigum in Northern Brisbane. And um, there's concern there that not enough people uh, from the ages of 18 to about 35 or 10. And it was actually odd because I was looking at them and I was a bit surprised how many people in that age bracket seemed to be there. But that, that reflects, probably my own experience of the that how volunteerism often doesn't happen in that age group I think compared to what is actually going on in their community where the expectation of volunteerism is so strong is that there's even a bit of a drop off in a in one sort of age mm -hmm. bracket it's noticeable mm -hmm. uh, where from my point of view I mean I'm looking at 12 year old kids popping up to do the washing without being asked um, there were 18 19 20 year old uh, students doing some of the service uh, and um, participating, you know, at some levels. A lot of the cooking is done by retirees, that is true. So, you know, from, from my perspective, I was surprised how much participation was at that age group. Mm -hmm. And it's a hard time because, you know, you're studying and then you're getting jobs and then you're having kids and you're buying houses and you've got mortgages. So it's a very busy time in your life. Um, so Do you think that's the reason that, they, that more young people don't generally get involved in volunteering or is it? Yeah, I think it's, else. yeah, that is, I think, a big part of it. There's a lot of things happening in your life in a short period of time. And you've got a social life too, mm -hmm. particularly until you've got kids. Like, you, um, you, all those things become time pressures. And so uh, it does, you know, have a bit of an impact. And I, I, I don't think that's a particular problem either. I mean, but it's a concern in the community and it's quite probably different from the Indian setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you speak to people about your project, what do people... Think. Do they know about the seats? What are, what's like the first thing that pops into their head? Um, if I speak to Sikhs, they they get quite uh, they they re feel excited that someone's interested, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, other people who are not Sikhs don't know about it by much. Oh, okay. um, and so uh, the QAR in general, when we speak to uh, religious people, they're really excited about it. And I think that's due to a weariness around how religious groups and religious people are presented in the media often, um, because it's, it's often quite negative. Um, and that, that's partly the way media works. You know, you, you, you sell stories by bad stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so but it's interesting what you said about how long they've been here. Mm. And then there's still that kind of lack of knowledge as we talk about, oh, yeah, we're a very multicultural society and all that, but not if you don't know, 
you yeah. know, what's going on down the street. And I, I, I know even within the Muslim space, you know, people will say, oh, no, we, we don't want them coming here. They're going to change things. They've been here for ages. They've been here for over 100 yeah. years. We've got a, the, the, the mosque in uh, Holland Park is over 100 years old. Mm. Um, and it's gone through a number of, you know, building iterations. Uh, so, yeah, it's a very old established community. And those, that Muslim, I mean, you can actually see some of the cultural confusions that go on. That community is really from South Asia. It's from what, you know, they, they arrive in a period when India and Pakistan are, are one, uh, when they're part of the colony, the British Empire. And, but they're, so they're from India. They were called often Cameliers or, or Syrians uh, because some of, some of them are involved in, in the Camelier practices in Central Australia, but they're not. They weren't from Syria, they were from India. Mm -hmm. um, and so that you get that kind of culture of confusion. And a similar example here is that happens now is Sikhs are often confused with um, Muslims. Uh, now, Muslims, if we know of all religious groups, Muslims in Australia have been persecuted more than any other in the last 10, 15 years. Um, and so Sikhs have often uh, experienced the same level of persecution. Um, due to a misidentification, and of course the persecution shouldn't happen anyway, it's based mm -hmm. around a lot of ignorance. So a lot of, I don't think, this is not something of, obviously that Queenslanders ought to be proud of, and I don't think many realise this, but after 9-11, the first mosque in the world that was attacked was a Queensland mosque, mm -hmm. the Brisbane mosque, um, which says something about why we're doing this project, because we are firmly of the view that those activities, that sort of behaviour is based on profound ignorance and the profound ignorance of what religious groups have done for the broader Brisbane and Queensland communities. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also based on the ignorance of basic religious ideas and facts and what communities represent and who represents them. Um, and so that's what part of the drive of the QAR. It's, it's a strong sense of the needing to be some religious literacy and part of it's based around, you know, basic issues of what a religion is. And part of it's based around um, how do you think about religious people and what they do? And mm -hmm. we think there's, a, a, amongst people who don't identify as religious, which of course is fine, I'm not religious myself, we think there's a great deal of confusion about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that, that's one of the reasons we set up the project. So do you think you can counter that kind of discrimination, tolerance, ignorance? I hope so. Um, I just think it's countering misinformation with good information and it's persistence. Mm -hmm. um, you can reach those people that are, I suppose, the, the, the most difficult, the ones that have yeah, well, really hard line views. Yeah, so that's, that certainly is hard to do. Now, that's one reason why this is a is it going to be a public facing website because if we, you know, you can write about in, intolerance and misinformation and, and uh, so on in academic journals for the rest of your life. And you're hardly going to get anyone <laughs> reading that. You know, the people that you're actually wanting to convince of a different perspective, they're not going to be reading those things by and large. Um, so the idea with the website is that then it becomes a part of a, a you know, public consumption. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, given that everyone finds stuff by the, via things like Google searches, you have the capacity to um, intervene in the search process through, um, you know, I'm no tech guy, but um, through, you know, what do they call it? The metadata in the mm -hmm. site. So that was, that was sort of what we're thinking. You know, we want when, if you, if you again, take Islam as an example, I had a, an undergrad student do a project just looking at the courier mail in a, you know, two month period and how it represented Muslims. And two things came out. There's something like 90% of the stories were negatively tinged. Um, I can't quite remember the number. And, but, also, but not just that. The Muslims were, when, were by and large never consulted in the writing of the story, and which is a kind of basic failure of journalism. You, you're supposed to get balance mm -hmm. in, in the writing of the story. Um, so, you know, one of their objects is that people like school teachers and journalists and politicians and just anyone in, who's interested can actually find a decent level of information uh, about religious groups and what they do. Um, 
that's the, you know it doesn't always have to be positive, but we we do think that the the positive community based story of what religious groups do is kind of get gets lost. You talked about religious literacy before, which would bring me to the next question about kind of religious education in schools. Now, a lot of people would think of religious education as, oh, that's right, that RE stuff you have to go to, and then you listen to a really basic, uh, uh, usually Christian, um, you know, RE. There's another model out there that um, is better. I think, well, I don't, don't want to, I, I don't want to, you know, there's a there's a place in the world for or maybe better what I call formation, and, and I'm no theologian, but as since I'm not religious myself, I, but uh, you know, there, people make their own choices about formation, and that, I don't think we should be saying don't do that. But I do think that the more important kind of civil building education around religion is actually a, a broad based. Uh, study of religion from really a broadly a secular point of view. And by that, I mean, you know, rep representing them as a sort of all equal participants in whatever we call, well, where do you think religion is? Um, and, you know, trying to uh, discuss what people believe or what people do or what, uh, and, and what they've done historically, where do they come from historically, where are they now? Um, and that gives you a better grounding to try to understand some of the global complexities that go on, which include, you know, things, uh, a lot of violence, which is sometimes attributed to religious groups, uh, trying to evaluate whether the motivations are religion or are they something else. But, but by and large, I don't think Australians are in a good place because they have a very basic, poor understanding of religions in contemporary and historical terms. And it's because we don't have good secular programs in our schools. Uh, in Queensland, um, there are about 200 schools that adopt the Queensland Curriculum Authority curriculum, which is called Studies of Religion, uh, which is the ATAR curriculum. There's also Religion and Ethics, which is a non-ATAR curriculum. Again, it's meant to be broad based. It's uh, not, not as convinced about that one. Uh, that gets adopted by 200 schools that are all Catholic, pretty much, apart from a few outliers. Uh, St. Peter's Lutheran College is a, one Protestant school that adopts it. There are no state schools at the moment, I think, that use that curriculum. And I think that's a big problem. Um, you Obviously, families have a role in how they want to impart values to their kids and what they want them to, to focus on as good and worthwhile things. But I don't think, you know, we should just leave it up to families. We don't just leave it up to families for maths, English, history, social science or geography, uh, chemistry, physics. You can name any body of knowledge. We don't just leave it up to families. We don't just leave it up to church bodies. We think there are these things ought to be taught in schools. Well, I think also religion should be taught in schools, but not theologically, but rather uh, you know, in the way that we would think what we're doing here, a kind of secular study of religion. Mm -hmm. And why don't you, why do you think it hasn't gone like that, that more schools aren't adopting the studies of religion? Um, I don't, well, I think there's a few factors. Um, there's been no buy-in from the independent sector, which is dominated by Protestant schools in Queensland. Um, I think that's because they tend to be quite strongly focused on formation and don't, you know, don't often really want to discuss other religions that might be perceived as viable options. This is despite the fact that their communities of students are often, you know, quite diverse. And my son goes to a Protestant school and um, uh, he, their, their Christian education program um, was kind of good pastorally, but in terms of knowledge, about even Christianity wasn't very good. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't named the school, so I suppose I could be free. <laughs> sometimes so you I, have a friend who knows of this school, <laughs> yes. I mean, sometimes I just thought it was balmy. And I thought, you know, if you wanted to, if you even were serious about the formation, you're probably not being very good at it in the way that you're teaching it or the things that you're teaching and the things that you're making at the centre of the story that you want to tell. 
Yeah, and we've had that experience too. I mean, I've been to religious schools where they say uh, their religious education is a, a, like a half an hour a week or something like yeah. that. And then you've got other religious schools where you tell people, actually, a lot of the students here aren't religious. Yeah. And people are like, what? But it's a religious school. Shouldn't we be getting lots of young people from that school to church? Yeah. You go, well, no, a lot of them aren't religious. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the fact is, particularly in Protestant schools, if you only recruited from people from your own denomination or even broadly in the Protestant tradition, you, you'd probably collapse. <laughs> because if we know the numbers from the census, if we take those seriously, the Protestant identification numbers are the ones that are collapsing. The Catholic ones are not. Mm -hmm. um, and then other religions coming from elsewhere in the world that look like minority religions now, they're the ones that are the fastest growing ones. Mm -hmm. And what about state schools? Why haven't they adopted? Because, you know, there's all this criticism about why are we teaching RE? You know, it's not good. Wouldn't they like this idea of a more academic? Yeah, well, you'd think. And I don't know. And it's hard to know because we're not well plugged into that sector, partly because the mutual interest doesn't seem to be there. Um, I'm a state school product and I didn't have any type of that kind of education either. In, that was in Victoria. Um, I think partly it's a to do with resources. You, there's only you're not. I mean, the reality is, you, if you have that program in your schools and it's not compulsory, a lot of Catholic schools will make the studies of religion program compulsory, along with a formation study uh, subject as well. But if you're in a school where, you, where that's not going to happen, then you're probably going to start with pretty low rates of participation in that course. So you don't know until you try. Um, and um, that creates a staffing and resource problem. And we know the state sector is not as well staffed and resourced as the um, uh, as the religious schools or the, the um, independent schools. So mm -hmm. I suspect that's part of it. It takes often an impassioned teacher and you get a lot of that, you know, the Catholic sector, the, the teachers are often Catholics, but they're really passionate about the broader study of religion as well, not just teaching about Catholicism. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's really important. If you don't have teachers who, um, who take up a subject area as a cause, then you're probably not going to get that energy in the, in the school or the school sector. Um, there's a, you know, we've, we're not entirely sure how we make that connection with the state sector because it's, it's very hard to find people or how you mm -hmm. start to do it. But I think maybe the conversation might need to happen at another level where, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the policy directives that might help drive a, a broad-based studies and religion program in schools? Yeah, there's certainly, like you said, there's certainly a secular case for it because no matter what you think about religion itself, it is obviously something important to a lot of people around the world, it has an influence um, in the world. And so understanding that and not just yeah. your own religion has value. Yeah. So what, one of the things that I, you know, one of the confusions in Australia is actually over the whole idea of what secularism is and where it came from, because it's not anti-religious in its formation. Um, secular, the people who develop secular ideas, and there are different kinds, they're, historically they're mostly religious people. And that there was, you know, if we take the American model, which is the freedom for religion model, that's where that secular model comes from. It developed out of a suspicion of the state uh, being involved in preferencing one religious group over another. And that came from religious people. They were the ones who were motivated to drive that. You know, in, in the, the, the freedom from model, which is what you get in Northern Europe and is the, the most obvious example today is France, because they've got quite um, asymmetrically, uh, um, asymmetrically pursued rules on how religion is displayed publicly. And I, when I say asymmetrically, I think there are some minority groups that are uh, asked to conform to that more than other groups. Um, but that, you know, that freedom uh, from model comes out of the suspicion of, of clerics. And it's from other types of religious people often. It's not just, um, it's not from people who don't have belief or who are not identifying with a religion. Mm -hmm. I think in Australia that often gets turned into we shouldn't have religious discussions and religious people should not air their religious views in public spaces. And I think that's not sensible at all and doesn't fit the historical models. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you actually had a better study of religion in schools, people might appreciate that a bit more and be a little bit more tolerant of people 
you know, expressing their views that are informed by religious ideas, because if you are religious, how could it be otherwise? You know, how could you expect, if we think of prominent people, you know, Tony Abbott, Kevin Rudd, Scott Morrison, all of strong faith, how could you expect them not for their religious views not to inform their political views. That would that seems to be very unreasonable to me. And we'd all be better off if it was uh, it was this part of the discussion. We'd be able to identify what we did and didn't like and where it came from and so on. But, so there's something to my mind that it's a maturity problem in Australia about how we discuss religion. We Can you tell me, reaction. I'm sort of cut you off there. Can yeah, you tell on. me uh, a little bit more about sort of the religions that you study from the Southeast Asian area? Well, yeah, so I've worked mainly on South Asia, a little bit on Southeast Asia. Oh, South Asia. But my, um, my teaching at UQ is mainly around Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, but I touch on other things. Uh, but it, part of that's just due to how many subjects we have. But, you know, sometimes I talk about Sikhism and Jainism as well. Uh, Buddhism, um, has, if you think about it in cultural terms, is because it spreads right across half the world, before the modern period, um, it's very important for understanding and thinking about Asian cultures, uh, you know, wherever you are. And now, of course, in the modern period, it's it's had quite significant um, increase in popularity in the West. Um, so, and then uh, Hinduism is largely today, you know, if you leave out the diaspora, which is Again, there's a big diaspora of Hindus around the world, including Australia. It's the fastest growing religion in Australia and has been for the last decade. Um, but historically, India has been, the, or South Asia has been the biggest area for the growth of Hinduism. Um, it did have a big influence on Southeast Asia in the first uh, millennium of the common era. And um, that's how we end up with Bali being uh, predominantly Hindu today. Um, but in fact, that whole, um, area was predominantly Hindu and Buddhist at one point. So, so what do people think when they go Buddhism or Hinduism? You know, what is the kind of the stereotypes that they have? And, 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 and can you mention some of the things that are part of the faith that don't get a lot of attention? Oh, <laughs> that's a so Hinduism. So when I meet people who, who aren't Hindu, you know, they'll say things like, oh, reincarnation, multiple gods. Oh, yeah. And then and Buddhism will say, oh, yeah, I like Buddhism more than the other religions. And it's not really a religion. It's a way of life. Yeah. Well, you've just said all the cliches. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you've what, answered what, the question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. So, so I was wondering if there's any others. And, and, and obviously, there's more to both of those um, um, than, than that. What, what are some of those? Well, Hinduism things? tends to cause the most confusion, and people find that um, the hardest to kind of get their heads around. And it's actually part of the nature of it because uh, they're, the word. Hinduism is an 18th century, late 18th century word, an English word um, that was coined by a missionary. And there, there was no, there's really no Indic word uh, that precedes it as a sort of name of a religion as such. Now, all words for religions are historical formations. They're all historically constructed and they all have different histories and looking into them can kind of uh, help help you uh, understand why the confusion or why the, what issues around what those traditions are can form. Christianity is no different. Um, now, when the word, even the word Hindu is not actually in origin an Indian word, it comes from Persian and it was a sort of a place name that, because it's the name of the old Persian name of the Hindus river in, which is runs now through Pakistan. So it was a, it was a geographic term. And then that enters West European languages, and that's how we get the word India ultimately from that. Now that's two and a half thousand years ago. The word Hindu then enters into Arabic at some point, and when you get Arab-speaking travelers going to India in the 11th and 12th century, they start using it to refer to the population. And then by uh, gradually that's taken on some religious color coloration because those Arab travelers were um, Muslims, and so they were often observing differences related to those communities. And that's how it takes on a kind of religious connotation. And then from about the 14th, 15th century, um, people who we think of as Hindus start using the word sometimes themselves, usually when they're talking about their own group identity versus another group, particularly Muslims and Christians. So it's got a history. And I, that's a, I know that that's maybe a slightly old answer to your question, but it oh. goes to the problem of 
when we talk about Hinduism now, we have a kind of way of presenting it as a kind of collective, as a, as a singular thing, where in fact, it's a whole bunch of diverse traditions. And so let's say when Westerners were encountering Buddhism and Hinduism, they were very concerned about finding something. And they were mainly, you know, a lot of them were Protestants. And so the Bible has a particular significance for Protestants in a way that's a bit different from Catholics. So when they're looking at these traditions, they're thinking, well, hang on, what's their equivalent to the Bible? And so they go looking for it. Uh, in Hinduism, that's how the Bhagavad Gita gets elevated to a similar sort of text, even though once you study these traditions, excuse me, then uh, you, you realise they're actually much more complex and diverse in their textual traditions. And there is no really such thing as a kind of equivalent text to a Bible that unites that tradition. It's just not the way it, it forms and develops and grows. There are lots of important texts and they're all important to different communities mm -hmm. within the broader umbrella of whatever Hinduism is. So that creates a whole level of complexity which um, students just find often confusing because they're looking at the, they're thinking of religions in very parallel mirrored terms. Um, the similar thing can happen with Buddhism because also its textual tradition is enormous and it, there are different ones depending on which tradition you're looking at. Um, and so that means, you know, to find simple catechisms of what Hindu thought is or what Buddhist thought is, is a little harder and requires a bit more digging and a little bit more contextualizing. And you mentioned uh, Jainism. Did I pronounce that yeah, right? Jainism. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about that? <laughs> Um, okay, so that starts around two and a half thousand years ago, just like Buddhism does. If we locate the beginning of those traditions with what the traditions themselves refer to as their founders. So they both uh, live in a period of, uh, um, uh, you know, an early urbanisation period. Um, and uh, there seems to be um, that both of them share along with some um, traditions that we identify with Hinduism these days that are expressed in texts called Upanishads, they, they share an interest in uh, ascetic pursuits. Uh, and so there becomes a division between um, what people who have jobs and families might do and what they might do in religious terms, and then people who are trying to step outside of those kind of complex networks of obligations to pursue some sort of ultimate release or some sort of ultimate existential answer to an existential problem. And Jainism is one of those uh, traditions that does that. And so um, like Buddhism, it develops a form of monasticism and, um, and, and that's kind of an institutionalized asceticism. Uh, um, so you often find Jain ascetics wandering in India. They also have temples which they'll gather at. Uh, Jains are divided these days between broadly the Shwetambara Jains who wear white robes and the Digambara Jains who are naked. Uh, and so that expresses what partly what asceticism is about. It's, it's about um, a humility. It's about uh, a, 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 um, an expression of poverty. Um, and you become dependent upon others for things like food because you're not meant to uh, be involved in in those kind of social and uh, economic activities. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually a very common thing in South Asian religions. You know, if we think of broadly Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism, that's, they share those qualities of having communities who are ascetics of some type and those who are, um, are involved in uh, um, domestic and social and economic obligations. Now they, they, they're religious as well, or can be religious, but they're, they, that you get that pattern within those communities. Well, um, thank you so much for, for joining me. And, and it was a fascinating discussion. If people are watching this, we're going to watch this and say, why didn't David ask Adam this question or that question? You can still ask those questions. Just get in contact with the Australian Student Christian Movement and we'll, we'll get the questions to Adam. Thanks very much, David. Um, and, uh, you know, if I can just spruik what we do here, uh, if uh, you're interested, uh, we're part of the Bachelor of Arts at UQ, the Studies in Religion program, and um, we we uh, we like talking about religion. So, <laughs> yeah.
if uh, that interests you, you can feel free to contact me. Um, just, uh, I don't know how you give my details, David. We can do that on, on our yep. Facebook page and, and things like that. Pop up my email and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. We also have a Facebook page and a Twitter feed if you do those things. Excellent. Okay.